A few years ago, I sat down to record an episode about trekking to Everest Base Camp. And when it came time to make the call on Skype to the guest, he wasn't there. And I could never get a hold of him ever again. It's like he dropped off the face of the earth. Since that time, I've been trying to find the right person to bring on the show to talk about trekking to Everest Base Camp. And it took me a while, but I finally found the right person. This is episode 174 with Russ Hepton, a.k.a. The Trail Hunter, where we talk about his experience trekking to Everest Base Camp and what it's like to have a YouTube channel creating hiking content. Welcome back to the show. I'm Paul Schmid, the host of The Pursuit Zone, a podcast that interviews explorers from around the globe to bring you their exciting stories. These are people that dream big, break out of their comfort zones, and take on ambitious pursuits. Let's start the show. And let me introduce Russ. Trekking to Everest Base Camp at 5,380 meters is not an easy adventure, but the reward is spending time in the incredible mountain landscapes of the Himalayas. Russ Hepton began his two-week trek starting in Kathmandu, Nepal. After an exhilarating 45-minute helicopter flight to Lukla, he set out with his guide toward Namche Bazaar at 3,340 meters and spent a day acclimating. The trek continued toward Dingboche at 4,410 meters and another rest day. After reaching Everest Base Camp, he attempted a challenging hike toward the top of Kalapatar, which stands at 5,643 meters. You can learn more at his YouTube channel called The Trail Hunter and his website, thetrailhunter.com. Russ Hepton, welcome to The Pursuit Zone. Hi, Paul. Thank you very much for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. Russ, where are you from? I'm originally from a town called Basingstoke, which is in the UK. Uh, it's a small town in Hampshire, about an hour's drive from London. I've heard of that before. Is it famous for something? <laughs> Well, there's a statue in the middle of the town, which is called the Basingstoke Willie. But um, <laughs> apart from that, that's, that's about as far as, uh, as that goes, really. I don't really know if it's famous for anything else. What did you hear that it was famous for? I, I don't know. I, I've just I've heard that the town named Basingstoke before. Oh, OK. It might have been from that. Could be. Could be. <laughs> who knows? Could be from a movie or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, did you go to university? Uh, I did. I went to Bournemouth Arts University and studied a visual communication course. I'm curious if the, the trail hunter is your f full time thing or if you're working a day job now. So I'm currently a graphic designer working in London. So um, we're basically doing like UX UI stuff. So I'm working for a client, which is the International Tennis Federation. It's a really cool client, really good kind of uh, website project that I'm doing. And what I love about doing this kind of work is that it enables me to have more free time after doing these contracts that I can jet off and go hiking around the world. So it's, it just, just kind of really works out for me, but in, in, I don't think I would ever get a full time job to be honest. So I've always been freelance. Nice. Yeah. It's nice to have a job like that. Cause you're kind of mobile. And if you want to pick up and move out of London, you can still work. Exactly. Yeah. So Russ, why, uh, Nepal, why Everest base camp? I know, for example, there's Annapurna circuit, why Everest Base Camp? Yeah, so I was kind of really torn between the Annapurna Circuit and Base Camp. I had been really interested in trekking in the Himalayas for years. I was actually, prior to going to Nepal, I was traveling around Indonesia for about a month. And I mean, Indonesia is so close to Nepal in, in compared to here in the UK that I was kind of like, I've got to just go there. I can't just be this close to Nepal and not go so I kind of turned up in Nepal and was like I, I had absolutely no plan and I'd heard of uh, obviously at the Annapurna circuit and I was torn because it was either choosing between a, a through-ish hike which was about 120 kilometers or so or doing something a lot shorter which was base camp but with base camp you get to see the tallest mountain on the planet whereas with the Annapurna it's Something which is uh, I'm more passionate about, which is long distance hiking. But I just thought I, this is the first time I've been to Nepal, so I'm just going to go straight for the Everest Base Camp, and then the next time I return, I'll I'll do uh, the Annapurna, just because I just needed to see Everest in the flesh. 
going up the the summit of Everest hasn't really ever been like a top priority for me. I think you have to really want the summit, but just for me to see it with my own eyes was like, yeah, wow, had to had to go with that. How do you describe it? Are you able to describe it when you see it? Yeah. So the first time you see Mount Everest with your own eyes is when you're on your rest day at Namche. And they say it's a rest day, but there's never actually such thing as a rest day because you spend that day actually going on a smaller trek, trekking up a bit higher uh, so that you can get used to some altitude and then you go lower uh, to go sleep. So the rule is that you trek high and sleep low. So on that rest day at Namche, you go up to this little village, which is about another 800 meters higher than Namche. Don't quote me on that. I can't remember the exact difference in altitude. But when you get around to this little village, there's like a hotel with a restaurant. Uh, And just before you get to that, you go around this corner and all of a sudden there's just this in the distance, like miles away. There's just this huge wall of ice with loads of mountains within it. And then right in the middle and just slightly to the left, you can see the peak of Everest sticking out and you can see all of the clouds like above Everest just kind of circling around it. And at first I'm like, is it that one? Is it is it that? one with the clouds that you can see and my guide was like yeah it's that one you can't miss it because it kind of looked like a volcano it's the most triangular one and when you first see it you can't really describe you can't get over how uh, dark in color it is as well because it's got snow on the top but you can see how black the rock is underneath just the sheer scale of it i mean there's so many mountains around in the area that are absolutely ginormous i mean they call it the land of giants for a really good reason you'd think that all these other mountains would dwarf everest and make it look smaller but it really doesn't like this mountain is so big but yeah it's just awe inspiring the the scale it's hard to tell sometimes when you're uh, just seeing it on video yeah yeah the, the camera never does it justice even in my own youtube videos i look back on them and Unless you're in it, and it's it's such a common thing to say, unless you're there, you don't really fully comprehend the scale of the landscape. It's it's incredible. How long were you in Nepal? So I was in Nepal for a total of a month. So I got the 30-day visa on arrival, which costs uh, about 40 US dollars. I I spent the first five days there uh, at the Airbnb that I booked. Uh, and then the um, the trek was 12 days. Um, it took me nine days to get up to Everest Base Camp in Kalapatar and then three to get down. And I had a an extra day in Lukla at the end because we got back a day early, which was quite nice because I could just chill out in Lukla. But then I had like a week and a half on the other side before I had to leave. And I just spent that week and a half in an Airbnb, just basically editing all of the videos and all the footage because I just couldn't wait to put them on my iPad and start putting it all together. So yeah, a month, a month in total. How much planning did you have to do before you went? So (laughs) the funny thing is, is I actually just turned up without any plan whatsoever. Uh, I had no idea really where to stay. Uh, So I I was just kind of watching YouTube videos like, because I, I, when I was in Indonesia, I only kind of decided that I was going to go to Nepal about a week before I had to leave before my visa there ran out. Yeah, I just turned up and was like, I'm just going to see what happens and see who I meet. And uh, yeah, luckily, the Airbnb host that I stayed with, he owned a trekking company, which was just opposite the Airbnb where I was staying. So a lot of the planning was kind of done while they were sorting everything out. Um, But yeah, you can you can literally and this kind of actually amazed me uh, how easy it is to just turn up there without a plan. And within three or four days, you're on a, f- a flight to Lukla. And <laughs> it's it's really, really good. Did you put any thought into where you were staying in Kathmandu uh, when you booked your Airbnb? The YouTube videos that I watched, I mean, so, there's so many out there and they're all very good. But most of them all point to Tamel as the, the trekking district in Kathmandu. So that's where you're going to find all of your trekking shops, all of your bars and all of your Airbnbs, hotels, hostels. Uh, anything you need to book, it's it's all there. Any any gear you need to buy, it's it's all right there in Tamil. So uh, it's a bit of a no brainer. I think it's about a twenty minute taxi drive from the airport in Kathmandu. So it's not too far. Yeah, you can just get everything there that you need. 
So what gear did you bring with you? Gear for me is probably the most important thing uh, that you have to kind of get right before you go. I'll say in terms of if we go back to pre- uh, preparation for the trek, because I, I do a lot of trekking in my own time back at home and in other countries, I've actually managed to dial in my gear so I could count that as preparation. But uh, I'll run through a quick list that I've prepared of just what I would say to your listeners are like the most important things to really consider. And then everything else is just things that you choose to go for. So I wanted to go like as light as possible without being stupidly light because the altitude up there can really kick you in, in the butt, basically. <laughs> like if you're going with loads of stuff on your back, it's going to feel probably three or four times heavier than it actually is. And I kind of practice ultralight backpacking as best I can, although the camera gear that I bring sometimes is a bit too heavy. But you don't really need as much as most people think for the Everest Base Camp Trek, especially if you're going in October, November or in the late spring time, just because in lower elevations, it's it's a lot warmer than most people expect. So you'll see people at Lukla wearing all these massive layers and all of this gear and these big heavy backpacks. And then all of a sudden the sun comes up and they're ditching half of their gear or they're, they're getting other people to carry it. Uh, so I'll run, I'll run through uh, a quick list of the things that I chose and kind of iterate on those if that's all right. So uh, shoes uh, are obviously like for me and a lot of other people, the mo- single most important piece of gear that you can probably bring. A lot of people obviously like to wear boots, but for me, I tend to go for more, especially for the Everest Base Camp Trek, went for more like a trekking shoe, just because it's a lot lighter. They're a lot more breathable. Uh, and for me, they're a lot more comfortable. I don't get blisters. So I went for, with a pair of La Sportiva Tempestas, which I actually bought in Tamel. And even though the rumors in Tamel, if, if you buy gear from the trekking shops there, that it's bad quality, these things were brilliant and they held up very well. And I still use them today. I've, there was no damage on them. None of the stitching was coming loose. So really good pair of shoes. In terms of socks, I was wearing in the lower elevations up to Dingboche, just a thin sports sock because it's so warm. And by the time you settle down in your tea house room where you're staying, it's that's when it gets really cold. So you don't really need like a really thick sock for the lower elevations. But as soon as you get to Dingboche, Lobache uh, onwards up to Gorakshep, that's when it starts to get sub-zero, really low temperatures during the day. So uh, wear like a merino wool sock for those elevations. Um, but I'd say if you're wearing like a really thick sock in the lower elevations, your feet are going to sweat and you're going to be more prone to blisters. I, I actually bought a really thin pair of gloves with me, which I kind of regretted at Kalapatar because the weather up there it took a funny turn while i was at gorakshap in the night and they weren't expecting it but it went down to minus 20 degrees in the in the night before we went up to kalapatar and that was just unbelievable cold that i i'd never experienced that level of cold before so a thicker pair of gloves would have been uh, a better choice in terms of clothes i wore just a, a base layer with a pair of long johns a pair of shorts on top for pockets when it got chilly during the day, just put my down puffy on. I wore a Northridge hybrid goose down puffy, so it was really light. Um, in the higher elevations up at um, Kalapatar, that's the only day that I wore a pair of hiking trousers just to keep the wind chill off because if you're wearing just a base layer, you're going to want to keep that cold wind off if it gets below minus 20, and they really helped out. And the backpack that I used was a Hyperlite Mountain Gear 2400 Wind Rider, and I've been using that pack for all of my long treks. I took it traveling with me. It was my only backpack. It served as my only hand luggage backpack, carried everything for the few months that I was traveling. Um, so it's really versatile, but it only weighs like 916 grams. So because it's made out of Dyneema composite fabric, it's really strong and really light. But because it's a really thin fabric, it's not as durable. So it won't last as long as like your Ospreys or something like that. But I just wanted to go as light as I possibly could with the gear that I already knew uh, as well as I knew. So yeah, that was a really good uh, backpack to wear. And then I had like a 30 degree Katabatic gear Palisade sleeping quilt, which was another really light piece of gear at 496 grams. I wouldn't say a 30 degree sleeping quilt is like 
the most ideal sleeping bag to bring to Everest Base Camp. But because I was staying at the tea houses, all of the beds had blankets. But I don't think the blankets would have been enough. But putting myself inside the sleeping quilt and then having the blankets on top was just perfect. And the blankets at the uh, tea houses as well, they weren't very dry. as Some of them were quite damp as well. So that kind of helped in that respect. So, yeah, that was that was kind of like all of the trekking gear that I'd say is like really important. Uh, when I was at Gorak Chef, I had to sleep on the floor in the tea house. So I bought with me a, a Thermarest Neo Air X-Lite sleeping mattress. And that was like a godsend because otherwise I would have just been sleeping on a hard floor. So that was the only time I had to use that. So it's not like an essential thing, but I was like I was prepared to sleep on the floor. So it was really good to have the sleeping yeah. mattress as well. Russ, I want to ask you about that because I watched that video and that was weird because you said your roommate yeah. basically urinated in his pee bottle and then he yeah. drank it. <laughs> so basically every tea house that I stayed in, um, I was lucky enough to get my own room. And now I'm totally fine in staying in hostels. I've stayed in so many hostels in my travels. Like, so that's not an issue. When I found out that I was going to be sharing with someone, like I was like, yeah, totally cool. So I got to go out check, like, yeah, you need, so you need to be with some other guy. Yeah, it's totally fine. But I was like, at least I've got a bed kind of thing. And I'm lying there. And at those altitudes, sometimes it can get incredibly difficult to sleep because the way that the altitude affects your breathing and gives you the odd headache here and there, well, it gave me the odd headache. Some people it gives incredibly bad headaches but it does really affect how you sleep so coupled with the cold the high altitude not being able to breathe very well and the headache uh, I was put in a room with a chap who um, quite kindly thought it would be a good idea to urinate in a pee bottle but I don't think he put the cap on or he was incredibly dehydrated because it just smelt the room out so so bad and I was kind of lying there just thinking this is the worst like sleeping situation I've ever had like and I can put up with a lot but because of everything else so I was like right I'm just getting up I'm gonna set up my sleeping mattress in the lobby where everyone eats and just went on the floor anyway within like five or ten minutes of trying to get some sleep loads of people started bowling out of their rooms and getting ready in the lobby to uh, go up to Kalapatar for the uh, sunrise so I actually didn't get any sleep that night um, I think I probably if I did get any it was like half an hour's worth so yeah that actually made it very hard going up Kalapatar so the guy actually drank his urine <laughs> is that true he did yeah he did yeah yeah man is there a reason why you, why somebody would do that I think it was on his breath, and that's why it made the room smell. So it was, it was really bad. I don't know. Some people do it. I think Bear Grylls does it. Oh, man. Um, someone else on TV does it. A couple of YouTubers that, that are hikers, I know that they do it because something to do with nutrition or, like, I don't know. Oh, I, I don't want to beat this one to death, but I just I was just curious because I didn't know if it was a thing or if it was just happened by accident. No, no, it was definitely a thing. But, um, yeah, I don't think uh, – he did it by accident because one, I heard it happen. And then two, I heard him drink it and I was just like, no, nah, that's, that's not right. <laughs> okay. I want to just ask another follow-up gear question. Does sure. it make any sense to buy gear in Tamil when you get there? Or, I mean, are the prices going to be uh, to your advantage or does it make sense to plan it out and bring what you need beforehand? It's totally fine to buy little items of gear in Tamil, like your least important items like if you if you're traveling light you can't get on a plane with uh, trekking poles so you, you can buy those there the chances are that a trekking pole is probably going to hold out although the first trekking pole that I bought in Tamil failed when I put some weight on it so if you do buy any kind of gear in Tamil, make sure that you test it as best you can in the store try it on you can buy things like hats glasses gloves socks things like that, but I definitely would make sure that you buy your backpack, your down jacket, especially like any any kind of down equipment, any kind of insulation equipment that you need. 
and especially your shoes as well. I mean, I because uh, I was traveling in Indonesia, I actually didn't have a pair of suitable footwear for the Everest Base Camp trek because I just turned up with my New Balance Minimus. So I was kind of, I had to buy some footwear somewhere. So I was lucky that I found a pair of what looked like legitimate La Sportiva Tempestas there. So just check the stitching on things and things like that. And the price difference, you can haggle in um, Nepal. It's totally fine. And what I would recommend is that you haggle down to at least 25% from the asking price. But obviously that can get your price down. But if you're getting gear that's not up to scratch and you're paying a little bit less than you might as well just bought the legitimate thing back at home and bought it with you. But it all depends on your circumstances, such as myself with my footwear. What was your experience hiring a guide? As I said earlier, I didn't actually plan anything. So luckily, the Airbnb host was a trekking company owner as well. They handled everything from the Tim's card, uh, all the permits, all of the accommodation. I'd say most of the accommodation they actually rang ahead and pre-booked. And the guide was included in that package as well as the flights and everything else. Do you think that it's worth it to go that way versus trying to do it yourself? Uh, it all depends on your experience level. And when I say experience level, I don't just mean like your fitness. I'd say it's more down to whether you've hiked at altitudes above 3,500 meters. And if you know what it feels like to be walking all day in altitude I mean, I've hiked a lot of the volcanoes in Indonesia. The tallest one was Mount Rinjani at 3,700 and something meters. That really um, kicked me in the head hiking up there. And I actually kind of figured out how to kind of deal with that level of altitude uh, effects while I was on that volcano and learned how it felt. I'd had a little bit of practice with it and, and knew what I was capable of. So I thought to myself, if I can... If I can hike to 3,700, what's 5,000, almost 6,000 meters going to feel like? So because I didn't know, I said, right, and I'm traveling alone, I thought I'd better go with a guide because if it all goes pear-shaped and you need help, you're going to then put other people at risk to come and help you just because you're on your own. Whereas if you're with a guide, it's much better because if you need help, you've got help right there. You're not going to put another guide at risk or another tourist at risk. Uh, so you can just help sort yourselves out in, uh, in a bad situation. So if you were going to do it yourself, help me figure this out. You would need to get a Tim's card. You would need to get some type of a permit. Then you would need to get your airline tickets to and from Lukla. Exactly. Yeah. The, the thing is, if you're going to do it yourself, you could go to a trekking company in Tamal and just ask them, to help you out with the things that you need done for you. And then you can handle whatever else you want to get sorted. So I don't know, to be honest with you, when I got to um, booking everything with the tracking company, I actually didn't get my own physical Tim's card. I never saw it. They just said all the permits are sorted. So I assumed that the guide had all of, when we went to the checkpoints, the guide had all of the documentation on him. So I assumed the Tim's card was with him. So a Tim's card stands for Trekkers Information Management Systems. So it just basically puts you on a register and um, if you need to be rescued in an emergency, they use the information on the TIMS database to access everything they need really quickly. Uh, and it also controls illegal trekking operations in Nepal. So it's very necessary to get one, although I didn't actually physically see mine. I mean, for all I know, I didn't have one. But it's Southeast Asia and things work really differently out there and um, more so than many of us uh, realize but yeah um, getting all those things sorted on your own you can just go with a trekking company get them to sort that out for you uh, and then you can go on your merry way on your own tell me about your guide his name was Karsan I think that's how you pronounced it I actually in my videos was pronouncing it Kalyan but when I, <laughs> I look back at the first video when he introduced himself I then realized I was saying his name completely wrong the whole trip and <laughs> he didn't he didn't say anything, but he was uh, such a lovely, uh, kind and gentle man, a very peaceful and very professional guy. Uh, he wasn't a Sherpa. He actually lived in a village um, south of the Him Himalayas, about a three-day walk from Lukla. Uh, so he'd, he'd actually trekked three days to Lukla before I even met him. <laughs> 
So when I got off the helicopter, uh, he was already there. Yeah, he he carried next to nothing in his backpack. I think he had like a 30 litre, like a day pack type thing. He just wear this one one change of clothes the whole time. He also just wear some really basic kind of trekking shoes. Um, so he, he'd been up um, to Everest Base Camp five times. I think I was the fifth time, actually. Yeah, he was a, a really similar build to me because it's quite important that they match you with someone who's going to be the similar uh, to be able to at least keep up with you because that's really important as a guide because uh, you don't want to be going on the trek with a guide uh, who can't keep up with you for starters. But yeah, he was uh, a really helpful guy. Like we go into tea houses and he was actually probably doing way too much in terms of service for me. So uh, that, it was a really nice gesture, but I didn't even have to get up to get my meal. He would go up and get it for me. He would order the food. He'd take my order and everything like that, like just handle everything. So if you're going up to Everest Base Camp and you literally don't want to lift a finger, you just want to focus on trekking, going with a guide is fantastic. However, I, I think it would have been for me a, a good experience if i'd actually kind of had a bit more of a uh, a test with my language barrier and maybe trying to order some things and speaking to more people but um yeah like to be honest like he 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 did everything in his power to make sure that i was comfortable um and enjoying my trip so yeah a really good experience with the guide what was the cost for that to have the guide so the guide cost i didn't actually ever get a breakdown of the cost from the trekking company if i had i'd definitely be able to tell you but um i i do know that they don't get paid as much as we would hope sorry russ what i was trying to ask is um overall the whole package what was what was the cost yeah sure so the whole package including flights and everything from the trekking company was just under a thousand pounds and then in terms of money and cash that I bought with me, I actually um, took with me £200 in spending money. And I don't think I spent all that. I think I spent about 140 It's not the cheapest of treks, but for two weeks, uh, going to see Everest with a guide and everything included, like I think that's about right, especially for Nepal. And anything less, I'd be like, wow, that's like crazy cheap but i think that's like a good price and uh, are the tea houses on top of that the tea houses are um included in the price when you go through the trek company and so then on top of that you just have the cost of your food and then any uh any tip that you give to the uh, guide at the end a few of the meals at the beginning of the trip were paid for with cash that the guide was given out of the lump sum that i paid the trekking company so when i met the guy i actually gave him the cash that the trekking company gave me out of my fee he paid for quite a number of the meals uh, until we got to like dingbache slash lobache and, and then i paid for a few of the rest because as you get up in the tea houses it gets progressively more expensive so normally people are taking taking a, a flight an, an airplane to lukla but that you took a helicopter I, I'd never heard. I didn't even know helicopters were an option. How did that whole situation play out? So this was a real big one because obviously the done thing is to get the flight to Lukla from Kathmandu in a plane. So you go to the airport in Kathmandu and you know it's going to be delayed. And if you don't know it's going to be delayed, I advise you that you should expect it to be delayed by at least six hours, especially in the high season. My flight was actually delayed by nine hours. Uh, I think I got there at eight in the morning and then the flight ended up being cancelled at about five o'clock in the afternoon. So I was like, I don't particularly want to, one, keep my guide waiting up there and changing the entire itinerary by booking another flight, having to stay in Kathmandu for another couple of days. I was just so desperate just to get to Lukla as fast as I possibly could so that I could at least start trekking that evening. And uh, if, when you go into Kathmandu Airport and you're waiting for your flight, you'll actually see that there's a, a helicopter company that specialise in just helicopter rides. Well, as soon as the flight was cancelled, I actually started getting touted by the helicopter company to uh, get me to go and pay for a helicopter ride to get there. And I said, well, how much is it going to cost? 
they tried charging me something absolutely extortionate. I think it was like 1200 US dollars to go by myself to get to Lukla. And I was like, I don't know. Should I do it? Should I do this? Like, anyway, like I was kind of looking around, looking at people who were trying to decide what to do. And um, a German couple came up to me and they said, oh, are you um, thinking about getting a helicopter? And I said, yeah, but they're trying to charge me something ridiculous. I know it's probably a haggleable price to get down to a, a something a bit more reasonable. Um, but we actually ended up chipping in the price, haggling it down. I think we paid like 350 US dollars each something like that which was just a bit lower in total but it was cra- it was way more expensive i think the single flight to uh lukla is about 77 pounds something like that was it 170 i think it was 170 pounds for the single flight uh via a plane so you're talking about doubling your money plus you're booking it last minute but i'll tell you what i do not regret spending that money in any way shape or form because the helicopter ride was probably one of the highlights of the entire trip because i'd never traveled by helicopter before as soon as it's booked as soon as you've got your ticket in your hand you're straight through security and you're on that helicopter and you're flying over all the mountains uh, in the himalayas looking at all the little tiny towns and villages going underneath you and it was just the, the perfect way to start the trip what i would advise actually to anybody who's going on this trek it's when you get to Kathmandu, if you haven't if you haven't planned it already, when you speak to your trekking company, specifically ask if they can book you a helicopter ride instead, because uh, you'll probably end up getting it a lot cheaper than the price that I paid. You you probably won't have to worry about getting the flight delayed or anything either, because it's a lot safer for helicopters to fly in that region going up to Lukla, because when you're going up to Lukla, the mountain range kind of goes down in like a valley and then a big lip up to the uh, runway. And if there's any form of cloud whatsoever up in those mountains, the plane won't leave Kathmandu to go to Lukla at all. So when you go by helicopter, that's not even an issue because they'll just use their radar system and then just land like a helicopter would land. <laughs> they wouldn't need the runway. So that's why I would definitely recommend, if you can, on the way there, at least uh, go to the helicopter because it will save you a lot of time and stress. When you finally make it to um, to Lukla and you start your trek, how many hours a day do you typically are you typically hiking? For me, the first day was I got there so late because of the delayed flight. Um, I only hiked for a few hours, but on the second day when we left the uh the tea house i think we were heading up to namche then and that was probably the longest amount of time that we were trekking and that was probably about six hours maybe seven hours and that was probably the toughest day in terms of the altitude gain because going up to namche bazaar you're just going straight up but the, the rest of the days after namche you're probably doing about three hours four hours I know from Panbache to Dingbache, that was only three hours, but it feels like longer because, again, the, the altitude just really slows you down. And when you're used to trekking at your own pace at normal sea level altitude, you can kind of go a lot far, a lot further and a lot faster. But yeah, I'd say anywhere between like three and six hours is like the, the normal kind of days hiking there. What are your most memorable moments about the trek up? So base camp is obviously amazing, but um, before I left to head out to um, Lukla, I actually was thinking, you know, I'm doing this whole thing on my own. I'm, you know, I'm doing it for myself. Like, how can I like do this for, you know, the people that I that are closest to me? Is there something I can do? And a couple of years ago, my mum's sister Linda died. She, I think she had a kidney removed years ago, and was suffering from heart problems and stuff like that and so she she ended up dying quite suddenly of a heart attack I think she was aged 52 or 53 so I thought it would be a really nice idea it'd be really nice for my family uh, especially for my mum if I printed out a photograph of my auntie Linda and, and took it up there and my original plan was to leave it at base camp um, but then I discovered I was going to go to Kalapatar which is 
at Kalapatai, you can actually get the best view of Mount Everest. Um, like you're right next to it, but from base camp, you can't see it. So I thought what I'll do is I'll take the photograph up to Kalapatai and that's where I'll leave it. And if you watch the last video in my Everest base camp track on my YouTube channel, uh, you'll just see me completely break down when I get the photo out and try to put it down. I'll actually, we didn't make it to the summit because uh, I just, my head just went and I had to stop because I started getting a little bit sick of the, the altitude. And um, yeah, I put that photograph down and it's it's up there right now looking at Mount Everest. And it, it was just a really sentimental thing to do. And like, you'll, you'll remember things like the tea houses, you'll remember the people um, and you'll, you'll remember the, the yaks and the food and, but when you actually get to Kalapatar and you're looking directly at the mountain and you've you've reached the highest point that you're going to go on that trek, that's when you'll be closest to the brink, if at all. And that's probably the moment for me that, that I won't forget. Yeah, very memorable. When you say closest to the brink, what do you mean? Because you've just trekked all of that way and you're in conditions that you've never... Well, for me, I, I was in conditions I'd never been in before, and it wasn't the, the longest trek I'd ever been on, but it was definitely, in terms of endurance, like it was it was tough. You know, I've I've had people in my YouTube videos saying, "Oh, it's a piece of cake, man!" Like, yeah, it's like you don't have to do any like serious mountaineering or anything. I'm like, no, 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 like it's a serious thing. And all right, there were there were people of all ages and shapes and sizes doing that thing. But I saw people getting dragged down, like with their arms around people's shoulders, like as pale as a sheet. So like so close to passing out, they they just couldn't do it. You know, that, that trek isn't easy. And when I got to Kalapatar and I felt it, I felt the altitude sickness kind of starting. I mean, the headaches that you get prior to well, like when you're on your way up, they're, they're just headaches. But as soon as you start feeling like you're going to pass out and vomit everywhere, that that's when you think, I've got to stop and think about what the hell I'm doing. And that's what happened at Kalapatar. It literally brought me to the point where I couldn't, if I kept going, I was putting myself at risk and my guide at risk. Um, so I made the, the, the very collected decision to, to stop and leave the photograph there because that's that's when it really brought me brought me almost to my knees so people going up to summit everest uh, that's an incredible achievement because i know i know how that felt at five thousand five and a half thousand meters let alone eight thousand meters above but yeah that that was uh that was to the brink in my in, in my experience did you end up having to take any, um, what do you call it? Um, did you end up having to take any medication to alleviate the effects of altitude? So, yeah, so it's actually called Diamox, but I think they've changed the brand name to it to mm. something else. But the actual medication in it is called acetazolamide. Acetazolamide, I've got it written down. So when you're when you're looking for your altitude sickness tablets, make sure it's acetazolamide written on the front. So I, my understanding of it was that you shouldn't take it before your trek. Um, it's not like uh, malaria tablets where you have to take them like a week or so before or something like that. But you should start taking them if you start to feel the effects of altitude sickness. Now, obviously, I'm, I was inexperienced in terms of altitude sickness. I'd never had it before, but I knew how altitude made me feel. So I said to myself, I'm only going to take one if I feel like I need to take one. But I will um, ask the guide if and when I should take one. Um, before I actually went up to Everest Base Camp uh, on the trek, my the guy that owned the trekking company, he said, oh, the guide will actually keep an eye on you and let you know when a good time to take the uh, Dymox tablet is. So we're going up on the Everest Base Camp trek and... I was kind of feeling okay, no serious headaches. Some of them were quite bad, but then they'd alleviate when I kind of got, I'd say when I was resting, the headaches were worse, but 
it wasn't so bad that I thought, right, I think I should start taking the tablets. I wish I'd started taking the altitude tablets when I got to Lobache or Gorakshep, at least the day before I went to Kalapatar. But then that's all hindsight because if I didn't realize that I wasn't going to get much sleep and not eat much the night before going to Kalapatar, maybe that's why the altitude affected me so badly that day. Maybe it was because I didn't take an altitude sickness tablet. I, I'll never know. It's, it's all hindsight. But some people, it just affects people. It affects different people in different ways. And it really doesn't depend on how fit you are or how strong you are. It's down to your biology. They, they've done some research saying that in, endurance athletes can do better in altitude uh, over someone who's more like a sprinter kind of athlete or someone that does short bursts of exercise so someone like a through hiker or a long distance runner would fare up very well in altitude they say but i mean i don't know what the research papers say on that that's just what i've read online and you know you don't know what you can trust online but my advice judging from just my experience is if you're not going to take them uh, on the trek most of the way, take them at least the night before or the day before you go to Kalapatar or base camp because they're the highest altitudes. Russ, what's the situation with water up there? Are you able to buy bo- you know, clean bottles of water at the tea houses? The tea houses also water. Prices vary the higher up that you're going. You, you can bring a water filter and there's plenty of water sources on the trail along the way uh, in the, the months that I went in the autumn. But I wouldn't advise bringing a filter and relying solely on that just because when you get to higher elevations, the filter can freeze and break. And if you then use it after it's broken, you'll end up probably getting sick. So I bought a filter with me, but I just stuck to the bottled water that was in the tea houses. And to be honest with you, Paul, I was completely and utterly paranoid about getting ill up there and the reason for that being is because i knew that if i didn't get sick in any way i could do it i could make it to base camp i I knew in my ability and i was determined to do it but the only thing that would stop me is if i got an upset stomach or food poisoning or anything like that so i'd heard rumors that in the tea houses to save on money they'll actually just fill up old water bottles and they'll take off the bottle caps. This is just a rumour. I don't know if it's true. I've heard that they'll take off the bottle caps in a way that doesn't break the seal, and then they'll refill the bottles with tap water or water from any source that they get without filtering it. So I was actually being super paranoid and putting a uh, water purification tablet into each bottle of water that I took just to be completely and utterly sure that the water I was drinking was fine. You probably don't need to do that, but... Just in my mind, because I really wanted to complete the trek so badly, uh, I just wasn't going to take any risks at all. What was your favorite part of the trip? That's a really good question. I mean, Kalapatar was like the most intense and memorable part. Getting to base camp was obviously amazing. Like, I'll I'll tell you what, when you get to base camp, make sure that I don't know if you're actually supposed to, but I just went straight down to the glacier and was just sat amongst the glacier, just listening to the, the cracking and the snapping of the ice around me. It was That was like mind-blowing to just be... I'd never stood on a glacier before. I'd never been that close to one. It was really good because there was like a, a rock where as the glacier had melted, it melted a block of ice to balance on top of this rock. And I stood on top of it and I got a shot in my, one of my videos of it. But then I was just stood on this rock and I was like looking around. And I was like, wow, man, I can't believe I can't believe I'm amongst all of this. That was one of the best parts just in that that moment. You'll get these little moments where you, you're either thinking, I can't be bothered to do it, do this anymore. It's too hard. And then about 10 minutes later, you'll have this moment where you're just just stunned by the beauty around you. It's the way I describe it is like walking through a painting. What about the trek down? Nobody seems to talk much about that. Is there anything worth talking about? So, yeah, I mean, I was going to make a video about that, but I decided for the trek down that I was just going to not use my camera and just take it all in. So I spent the whole trip up there filming 
So I thought, right, now's my chance to put the camera away and, you know, fully immerse myself in it. Plus, I was really tired. So sadly, I didn't make a film about the way down. But really important, it doesn't take long at all uh, to get down because obviously gravity is your friend. But you're you're also able to skip the towns and you're also going to be skipping the acclimatization because you don't need to do that anymore. So the trip down took me three days or the two might have been two, two or three days. But we actually, on the way up, you go from uh, Pambache to Dingbache and then Lobache. But on the way down, you'll skip Lobache and go straight to a town called Feriche, which is in the valley beneath Dingbache. So it's kind of like a shortcut back and you actually get to a lower elevation a lot faster doing that route. Some people take that way up, but that's the way that I went down. And then from Feriche, we just gunned it all the way back to was it Pambache one of the villages had a really big monastery and we stayed there and then from there it was all the way back to Lukla so it's really quick Um, and I was actually skipping the whole way down like walking really fast I was really light on my feet because I felt as soon as I got back into lower elevation my body was just like ah oxygen let's just let's just be normal again (laughs) you know like so my body was just like, woohoo, let's just like keep trekking. And it was uh, actually really good fun. Well, on the way up, when we left Lukla, I saw a lot of people who were just about to finish their entire trek and they were just so tired after the whole thing. But when I got back to Lukla, I was buzzing. I was like really full of energy. So yeah, that that's about all I can kind of say about the way back down because you're kind of almost going the exact same route and much faster it was all part of the experience yeah and your guide is still with you at this point yeah so he was with me the whole the whole way and even we even hang out at uh lukla uh for the day the extra day because we actually got got back a day early than we expected i think maybe because we were hiking so fast on the way back to lukla so yeah he was with me the whole time then we went to the bank in lukla to get some money out for a tip for him where do the guides sleep at night the rooms and the tea houses that I was staying in most of the way up were they had two single beds in. And I was more than like happy with the guide if he wanted to sleep in the same room as me. But I don't think that that's actually part of the the policy that they have as working guides for the trekking company. I think the rules are if I'm on my own and it's a bed, a two bed room in one of the tea houses, I don't think they're actually allowed to spend the night with you in the same room so they actually end up sleeping in like a communal room with all of the other trekking guides and all of the the tourists are separate in their own rooms i don't know what whether he was sleeping on the floor whether he had his own bed or if he had a sleeping mattress or anything like that so yeah all of the tea houses have their own separate area for the guys to sleep in so it's all kind of purpose built in in that respect Russ, would you, do you think that you would ever go back and do Everest Base Camp Trek again? 100%. 100%. But I I would go without a guide simply because, although it was, it was so good going with the guide and the benefits with going with the guide is language barrier is not a problem. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot easier in so many ways and you get to hike with someone, which is nice, but I've always preferred hiking on my own because doesn't matter where I'm hiking, the experience is so much more vibrant and more intense and you've only got yourself to rely on and you, you, you're you more open to speaking to locals, making friends with other people. If I went on my own without the guide, I'd be able to go at my own pace. But I would, I'd go back there in a heartbeat, 100%. And without a guide as well, it would be, as I said, a more intense experience as well. Did you learn anything from this trek that you're going to be able to carry forward into your other treks? Altitude, I think, was the biggest lesson. Not so much the endurance or anything, but I'd say in terms of the technical side of things, the altitude, and if I was to hike somewhere else at altitude, I would know what to expect. That was the biggest, I'd say, technical lesson that I learned. Another thing that I learned was probably the fact that there's not just Everest Base Camp Trek in the Himalayas there's hundreds if not thousands more routes that 
you could take. So again, if I was going to return, I'd do average base camp trek again, but there's just so many more to choose from. You could spend your entire life researching about those routes. So I think one day I'll just pick another one and <laughs> go for it. Maybe the Annapurna. What would be your advice to someone that wants to do an Everest base camp trek? My biggest advice would be to, if you've never hiked at altitudes of 3,500 meters or above, go somewhere that can offer you a trek at that altitude, at least 3,500 meters and find out how you react to the altitude first. Because again, I saw so many people getting carried down and so many rescue helicopters going up there, not just going to rescue people from Everest summit. That was, we're talking rescuing people from anywhere on the route because the altitude can affect you in uh, so many different ways and everybody's different. So yeah, definitely try hiking at altitude before you don't have to be super fit and you don't have to, have thousands of hiking miles under your belt. But as long as you know how you react to altitude, that's that's the biggest piece of advice I can give. I want to transition the conversation into the Trail Hunter and the YouTube channel. And how did you get the idea for this? I've been a graphic designer for the last seven years, a qualified graphic designer. I've always loved making things. Uh, and I, I enjoy my work but I, I most prefer my work when I'm making things for myself, whether it be a poster or my own website, or if I'm working on something for friends or, or family members, that's when I enjoy design the most. But then I found traveling back in 2015 uh, and hiking back in 2015 when I first trekked up to Ben Nevis in the winter without ever hiking a day in my life just absolutely fell in love with that as well. So along with the traveling, the hiking and the desire, like how can I, how can I make a lifestyle or a living which encompasses all three of those things? Of course there's YouTube. So I thought, right. I mean, I, I don't know much about film because most of the design work that I do is like web or apps and stuff like that or branding. But, um, I thought, right, let's let's give this camera thing a go and see how that goes. I started watching YouTube videos of channels like Joe Zahorian. I mean, he has got to be the, the one YouTuber that actually inspired me to start actually making the videos. Because it's one thing having an idea of thinking, oh, I might be able to do this. But then I was like looking at this guy, John, out in America hiking the PCT and uh, all these long trails and making these beautifully crafted films like they're really good so if you haven't if you haven't watched john zahorian before then go and check him out and yeah like i was like right i'm gonna do this i bought a gopro and stuck my face in front of it and uh, started talking and putting it down and walking and edited my first video two years ago and uh, yeah that's that's how it got started and I've, I've i haven't stopped making hiking videos since is it kind of your goal to you know have this ultimately become earn enough income from youtube to, to make this the full-time job if it could earn me 50 pounds a day that would be success in terms of making it i would say a, a semi-sustainable job but to be honest i've got like three and a half thousand subscribers right now and you can monetize the channel from a thousand and i haven't done that because i just don't want to put ads on the channel so and making money through the YouTube channel alone isn't really what I want to do. But what I want to offer my viewers later down the line is is a course on how to make adventure videos, how to edit videos, how to use a drone and how to do all the things that I do because I, I really enjoy teaching people. So setting up like an online course through my website uh, in the future is definitely on the cards. And I think doing things like that is how I could possibly generate a good amount of revenue to make it sustainable. But if it could be the full-time job uh, and be what I do as a living, um, it would just be uh, an absolute dream. 
How did you come up with the name, the trail hunter? So the first name I came up with was when I was traveling back in 2016. This is when I first, originally it was going to be like a travel everything kind of channel. So I called it Blue Dot Project. And that was like inspired by this guy called Carl Sagan. He's a scientist and he's really famous for the Blue Dot picture because he got this satellite out in space to turn around and take a picture of the Earth. And he called it the Pale Blue Dot. So that was inspiring to me. And then... I was like, this is travel. So I called it the Blue Dot Project. Anyway, I was like, this doesn't really... Later down the line, I got stuck into hiking a lot more and decided to focus the channel on that. So this name really doesn't uh, explain what I do very well. So I was like, what can I name it that's going to be like, this is what it is on the tin. It's a guy who goes around looking for trails uh, and hikes them and makes videos about them and gives tips and advice. So I thought, it's trails... And then, ah, I'm hunting trails. So the trail hunter was born. That's like the best explanation I can probably give you. It's a little, probably a little bit more long winded than that. But yeah, it's basically how it happened. No, it's a cool name. I like it. Thank you. You started the channel, I think you said in 2000, did you say 2015? Uh, I started the uh, channel in 2016 um, when I first went traveling. How has the channel evolved? So the first video that I ever made about hiking specifically was a a trek up to a place called Old Harry Rocks in Dorset uh, with my dad. And I seriously thought I was going to give my dad a heart attack on that trek because he tried walking up this hill and uh, he he could barely get up this thing. Anyway, it was just me and the GoPro and I was just being a bit silly on the camera and not really thinking about telling a story. Uh, and then over time, as I kind of was doing more hikes and watching other YouTube videos, watching like hiking films and climbing films and things like that, uh, I started getting more experienced with video editing and the software involved. The, the first like bunch of hiking videos that I made, they weren't really adding much value. I wasn't really explaining where I was in a artistic format. And I wasn't really explaining what the hike was involving in a in a more pragmatic way. So I wasn't like explaining to people, this is where I am now. And so then I, I did a hike up Penny Fan in Wales um, and actually showed people where I was on the map by giving points on a map and um, in the video, just guiding them through the entire process. But there was a lot of a lot of talking in that video and. Now what I do is now I've obviously got a drone and I've got slightly better camera equipment and I've got used to working with different lenses. Um, I've actually, I'm making videos that are just way more cinematic and actually try to evoke a sense of feeling to the viewer of how I felt on the trek a lot more. So uh, my, the last video that I made was a trek up to uh, the summit of Trifan, which is a mountain in Snowdonia in Wales. Just the way that it made me feel going up there was so intense. So I'll, I'll tell the story with the right music, the right kind of visuals. I'll get the, the, the right kind of shot for the way that it made me feel. So hopefully the viewer gets a sense of how the trek was for me and inspire them to go. They've evolved a lot in the creative sense, in the storytelling sense. And also I'm doing a lot more kind of high quality, more in-depth gear review videos and things like that. Whereas before it was like, so um, this is like this backpack that I've used like twice. Whereas now it's like, I've had this backpack on my back for like six months straight. And this is what I've done with it. And I know every single piece or thing or attachment or material that is on this backpack and I'll explain that in all of my videos and anything that I learn, I'll teach to my audience. And that's kind of where it's going at the moment. Hmm. Yes. You can tell that you really love that hyperlight mountain gear backpack. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually going for a, um, uh, a new pack soon, which is called a, uh, an atom plus, which is actually made by a team up in the Lake district here in the UK. And, they're the only company here in the UK making packs that are made out of the materials that I would choose. Um, and I actually did a backpack giveaway video 
a couple of months ago. So I went and met Tom, who owns Atom Packs, and spoke to him about doing this giveaway. And he gave me a nice uh, percentage off the pack. And I ran a competition on the YouTube channel, and uh, someone called Jackie won the uh, backpack, which is fantastic. I think she's just received it, and she's um, about to go on a trek somewhere in Europe with the Atom that she won. So. Yeah, it's really good stuff. So I like to give back to the audience as much as I can. And um, yeah, when I hit 10,000 subscribers, there'll be another backpack or tent or something giveaway. So yeah. Yeah, it was through you that I first heard of that Adam uh, pack company. Those are beautiful packs. They're really good and like really well made and really good materials too. And they're, they're different. They're a lot different from like the Hyperlite Mountain Gear packs. Uh, and they're kind of more geared up for modular attachments and things like that they're actually a lot cheaper you get a lot of people in in the uk actually purchasing a lot of their gear from the states because there's not many places to buy it over here but as soon as i found out about atom packs i was like right (laughs) i've got to get my hands on one of these it sounds like you started out with a gopro uh how how's your kit evolved filmmaking wise like what are you using now for camera and for a drone Sure. So the GoPro is like, it's such a wide angle. It's, in my opinion, it's not a very good thing to be filming because it just bulbs everything out into like a bubble. I then kind of upgraded to a, um, a DSLR camera. I think it was a Canon 700D, which was just so heavy. Now I've got a uh, Sony RX100 Mark V, which is possibly the best compact camera that I could have bought at the time. And that's what I filmed the Everest Base Camp trek in. The entire trek was filmed on that. I didn't even use my phone once. But now because I'm back in the UK and I'm not getting on planes and traveling everywhere, I've got a Canon M50 uh, with an 18 to 150 millimeter lens. And on top of that, I stick a Rode Video Micro. And I'll tell you what, that is the best camera that I've ever purchased. Ever. Like It was just so, like this, all of my latest videos are filmed on that. The angle of it of the lens you can zoom right in on things uh, it's a real good all-rounder the pictures like cinematic it's got really good color uh, it's really easy to use i'm going to be using the m50 for a really long time i think but because of its size when i do the pct next year i'm going to uh, probably just switch back to the sony rx100 because it does everything you need and it's probably no bigger than a pack of cigarettes you mentioned John Zahorian and his channel. Any other channels that you've been influenced by? Sure. Uh, Homemade Wonderlust. Her videos just gave me so much advice, uh, not just for long distance trekking, but for as a beginner. Um, she's really good. Obviously, Darwin on the trail. He's a really popular one uh, to watch. One of the guys that really inspires me a lot is Andrew Skirker. And he's got a YouTube channel, but he doesn't really post much on it um but he actually came up with the c to c route i don't think he came up with it but he did c to c route uh he did the um great western loop which connects the pct the pacific northwest trail the continental divide trail and the arizona trail to do this massive loop on the west side of the united states and he did a talk at google and just gave so much good advice on from his own experience and i think like someone like Andrew and John and uh, homemade wanderlust. These guys are like, they're like the best at what they do. And uh, the videos that they produce are going to be the ones that I want to watch and what other people want to watch just because of all of the experience that they've got. So yeah, really inspiring bunch of guys. What did you underestimate or perhaps not understand about having a YouTube channel when you started? Uh, The amount of time that it would take for people to start watching because the common thought is that when you start a YouTube channel, you upload a video and it's just going to get hundreds of views straight away. And that's not the case. Um, the first maybe 18 months of me having the YouTube video, I probably only got about 400 subscribers. That's coming up to two years. And in the last like three months, ever since I started uploading my videos more regularly and really, really wanting it. It's shown in the content and uh, that's when it started really growing. But I think making adventure videos, it shouldn't just be about the numbers. It should be about what you love and your experience. And 
these things take a lot of time and it, I very quickly learned that this thing's going to take a while. I'm in it for the long haul and uh, yeah, I, I'm just making the videos as I go now and that's it. What is your least favorite part about having a YouTube channel? I mean, the, the first thing that springs to mind is the negative comments, but they don't even like bother me very much. The least favorite thing is not having enough time to make more videos. But when I'm between contracts, I'm probably making about three or four videos a day. I'm, I'm going hiking every other day and I'm outdoors all the time, which is where I want to be. Not having enough time to make the YouTube videos uh, right now while I'm in work is probably my least favorite part. Um, but yeah. And what about the flip side, the most favorite? Uh, it has to be the most amazing comments that I get. Some of them are just so like, it's when I get comments. I mean, I'll, I'll read one out if you don't mind. I'll just find it. So one of the really good comments that I got quite recently, which this kind of thing is one of my favorite things about having the channel is, this is a really good quality video. I really owe my love for the wild and nature to you. I'm looking forward to doing Ben Nevis in the summer. And it's comments like that. And I get them, I get them quite regularly and when I first started the channel, I didn't think I'd ever get comments like that. I didn't think I'd ever really, really inspire people to get outdoors. But really, that's that's all I'm trying to do because it, it's something that I really enjoy and really love and just want to share that with people. And comments like that just um, kind of confirm that what I'm doing is the right thing. So, um, yeah, very rewarding. Russ, what's next for you? The PCT is the big one. And that's going to be next April. I was going to do it this year. I was going to do it on the 1st of May. I had my permit ready. I had accommodation in San Diego ready to start the PCT northbound. And uh, sadly, um, my dad fell ill this year uh, after having a couple of strokes. He's, he's fine now, but I didn't really want to leave for four to six months so soon after he'd fallen ill. Um, but we've had a chat. And uh, he's on the mend and he said that I've got to go next year, no matter what. Um, so it's happening next year, the PCT. I've been thinking about it for God knows how long. And I I know that I'm ready. My mental game is ready for the long haul. So, um, yeah, it's just been a dream of mine for ages. I will be doing the um, West Highland Way up in Scotland, which is about 90 to 100 miles. I'm going to do that this summer. That's going to be like this year's big big trek, but next year, definitely the PCT. How can people contact you if they want to learn more? So the best way to contact me directly is through email. So hello at the trailhunter.com, or you can just leave a comment on one of my videos. That's a really good way. I do have a website, which I haven't updated in way too long, but you can contact me through there as well if you wish. The trailhunter.com. The trailhunter.com. Okay, Russ Hepton, thank you very much for coming on the show and sharing your story of trekking to Everest Base Camp. And good luck with everything with the YouTube channel. I'm excited to see it evolve and to see what happens. And of course, good luck and best of luck on the PCT next year. Thanks very much, Paul. It's been an absolute pleasure and keep the podcast coming. It's really good. Thank you. Thanks again for listening. You can find this episode online at thepursuitzone.com slash tpz174. Be sure to head over to thepursuitzone.com for the link to subscribe to the show. And be sure to like the show on Facebook or follow along on Twitter. The tag is at the Pursuit Zone. You can send me feedback at paul at thepursuitzone.com or you can also leave a voice message at speakpipe.com slash thepursuitzone. This episode was recorded on June 5th, 2019. For the show notes and more great adventure travel podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com. Mm-hmm.